Good afternoon. My name is Helene George and I'm your facilitator for this session. And the session that we're in is Through the Storm, Are We Ready to Face the Uncertainties of the Future? And our presenter is Professor Chris Miller. Professor Chris Miller is a Professor of Social Work and Social Planning at the School of Social and Policy Studies of Flinders University, where he's been since September 2008. So he's joined us all the way from Adelaide. It's come to a bit warmer weather. Previously, he was Professor in Applied Social Studies at the University of West of England at Bristol. And he's a former editor of the International Community Development Journal and has been on their board since 1982. Since joining Flinders, he has worked closely with the Wentworth Group of Concerned Sci Scientists on water reform in the Murray-Darling Basin and was co-author of the influential June 2010 Wentworth Group report, Sustainable Diversions in the Murray-Darling Basin, an analysis of the options for achieving a sustainable diversion limit in the Murray-Darling Basin. He has made contributions to both the Murray-Darling ba Basin Authority in response to the guide and the draft basin plan, and to the Commonwealth Parliamentary Inquiry into the social and economic impacts of water reform in the basin, uh, uh, inquiry chaired by Federal MP Tony Windsor. So the Murray-Darling Basin is one of those very, very large complex issues that Australia has faced and hesitated probably, and had a few fa false alarms at actually addressing. So the discussion today is about the complexities we face in terms of policy with new challenges and the uncertainties that we face in the future. Please join me in welcoming Chris Miller. Thank you very much. And uh, as is the way in Australia, we uh, instantly find that we have a connection in that we were born and brought up not 20 miles away in uh, the northeast of England. <laughs> <laughs> but I think my accent is still a bit stronger than <laughs> Alina's. Um, so first of all, I'd like to thank everybody for coming along to the session this afternoon. Uh, it was a great pleasure to be uh, invited to speak at the uh, Brisbane Ideas Festival. And I was especially attracted to the notion that this was really a festival about starting conversations. This appealed to me because in my work in the Murray-Darling Basin, I've spoken often about the need for what I'd call kitchen table dialogues as a way, as a way for communities to uh, come together to plan for the future. So what I'd like to do really is to offer some very modest observations and reflections, and obviously would welcome, would welcome your responses, and hope that what really emerges uh, from this afternoon sparks off other conversations around this particular theme and the theme that I want to address is really our capacity to think and work our way through some of the more challenging issues facing Australia in what are changing and uncertain times. It seems to me that our ability to uh, meet these challenges, uh, which are by no means confined to Australia, of course, but will have profound implications for future generations. My observations and reflections are largely based upon the work over the last two years of water reform in the Murray-Darling Basin, but also following discussions with colleagues around a range of other issues. My work in the basin has involved two collaborative pieces of research, both funded by the Murray-Darling Basin Authority, but more, co more crucially, a very close collaboration over the last two years with the Wentworth Group of Concerned Scientists. Currently, I'm a member of one of the uh, Murray-Darling Basin Authority's technical advisory groups on social impacts, and I've been uh, advising the authority on the value of localism as an approach in, in relation to the plan's implementation. My observations, though, are limited in the sense that uh, I'm a relative newcomer to Australia. Some might politely suggest that uh, I'm too much of a newcomer to be able to say anything at all. Um, but that uh, being a recent uh, migrant, nevertheless, does give me the advantage of seeing some things with perhaps a fresh pair of eyes. However, I have to say that my uh, observations are not grounded in many years of experience of Australian public life, and there are, of course, many nuances and how things are done here that are still unknown to me and perhaps also to yourselves. But nevertheless, I was kind of reassured recently from uh, some comments made by others who are much more knowledgeable and experienced than um, myself, but comments that are uh, echo really in, in terms of uh, similar concerns. 
One recent example was, the, um, was Lindsay uh, Tanner's uh, book, Sideshow, Dumbing Down Democracy, in which he uh, writes about the fixation by both the media and politicians with the, um, with the political contest as a game, as entertainment, focused on the politics of the moment, driven by public opinion polls and focus groups, rather than the careful deliberation of the substance of political policy and decision making. And similarly, the journalist uh, Paul Kelly also recently wrote about the 2010 federal election as marking a shift towards a political timidity and short-term horizons, and reflecting on political party leadership in both of the major parties, noted that volatility is now the name of the game. So what's the nature of this problem? Well, my sp starting point really is in thinking about this was observing the impacts and responses, first of all, to the 2009 Black Saturday Victorian bushfires, the millennium drought in the Murray-Darling Basin, and then more recently, the devastating floods that swept through Queensland, New South Wales, and Victoria, causing death, injury, and destruction of homes, businesses, infrastructure, and threatening the survival of whole communities. Those floods were met with a determination and no small amount of public and community mindedness to repair the damage and support those traumatized. The emphasis being on cleaning up, bouncing back, putting the town back together again, rebuilding and restoring things to how they were before, no matter how much it costs and how long it takes. Prime Minister Julia Gillard suggested at the time that the volunteer effort financial donations and phlegmatic stoicism of those who suffered loss, as well as the num numerous acts of kindness and bravery, were all evidence of that Australian spirit. As she said, what makes this country great? And all evidence that it was alive and well. And even Queensland Premier Anna Bly, who so impressed throughout the crisis with her leadership qualities and her capacity to provide a safe container for the anxieties of those in the firing line whilst continuing to make decisions based on sound judgment, still felt it was necessary, and perhaps indeed it was, to call upon the legendary Queenslander, as in, we are the people that, are, that they breed tough north of the border. Those events, bushfires, droughts, and floods, tested the resilience and the capacities of local communities and state governments. Yet they called forth, in one sense, our coping strategies rather than our capacity to adapt for a very different kind of future, a future that we might be unable to predict with any degree of confidence. Paul Kelly, again, is of the view that the Australian character is relaxed in prosperity and propelled into action only in a crisis. Ross Garno has suggested that 25 years of unbroken economic growth has produced lethargy within the political system. So the question posed here really is whether the qualities as demonstrated so effectively in response to the crises are sufficient and appropriate to meet the range of challenges that Australia has to contend with now and in the future. I would like to suggest that disaster management is in a sense an old problem, quite different from the uncertainties of what lies ahead. Disasters caused by flood, fire, wind or drought will remain no doubt a feature of the Australian landscape and the Australian spirit will again, no doubt, be evoked as a way of responding to and coping with such events. However, solving long-standing complex problems, sometimes generically referred to as wicked issues, on account of the fact that they persist or grow worse, despite numerous efforts over a long period of time by governments of all persuasions, and the not inconsiderable amounts of money thrown at them, require a very different kind of response. Problems such as the health and well-being of indigenous people, glam gambling and other addictions, obesity, social exclusion, growing inequality, have all defied all interventions to date. But we also face new problems and new challenges, and they're more unpredictable and uncertain. The impact of climate change, water reform, population growth, global migration, and the emergence of Australia as a truly uh, as a truly diverse multicultural society, learning how to live with difference. These are all challenges that take us into somewhat unknown territory. 
posing fundamental questions about what is valued, how we live our lives, how we organize society, and how best to develop our adaptive capacities. As academics Evert Lindquist and John Wanner wrote recently, cascading and often unpredictable challenges continually confront governments who are forced to rethink what they do, when they do it, and how they do it. But they must do so in compressed time frames with incohate ideas and incomplete information. They note, too, they note too that in such turbulent times, it becomes more difficult to implement, uh, implement policy and even more tougher to anchor policies over time, an analysis that makes Lindsay Tanner's thesis even more disturbing. So when faced with the prospect of significant change in our lives, there are a number of ways in which we can react. One response, of course, would, would involve all those who are affected sometimes after a lengthy period of inquiry, deliberation, and reflection to accept the necessity of change, pool what resources they have to adjust their lives, and move forward in a new direction. Even in this scenario, when the change required is for the greater good, then the wider community has a responsibility and obligation to ensure that those most affected, those who have to make the greatest adjustments, or who have most to lose, are supported in ways that seem appropriate to the standards and values of that community. A second, perhaps more common approach, would involve resisting change. In this case, people would mobilize resources to minimize the level of change so as to allow them to maintain a kind of business as usual approach. In resisting, we screen out those factors that might create doubt, we split people into good or bad, and we project onto the other negative characteristics and motivations, including our own. And while resistance might be an effective short-term response, if change is inevitable and outside the control of the individual, the long-term benefits of this kind of approach are limited, and the fact, that the, and the, and the fact is that probably impacts of, of the change would be worsened. A third option, and in a sense a variation of the second, is simply to do nothing, a form of kind of passive resistance in the hope that whatever triggered the proposed change will go away on its own accord, or that someone else will intervene and, and it'll be no longer necessary to do anything, someone else will solve the problem for us. Such a response can also take the form, in a sense, of descending into a state of depression and, and despair, where we're unable to see how we can exercise any kind of agency at all in the situation to influence either the process or the outcomes. A fourth option, would be to seek to escape the change and to recreate a business as usual situation somewhere else. In this scenario, the person realizing that it's futile to resist doesn't like the prospect of living with the predicted consequences. And as a result, those with the capacity, the skills, the resources, the motivation, and the opportunity to relocate do so. They leave behind them a much more depleted community in terms of its economic, human, social, and cultural capital. Those who remain as a result may, longer be, may no longer be in a position to embrace the change or can do so only with severely diminished resources. And as a consequence, communities are unable to adapt and instead enter into a spiral of decline in which they become unattractive to external capital investment or, or to new migrants. And it's very difficult once that spiral takes place to begin to try to reverse the process. So which of these responses to change is adopted will depend on a range of factors. But what is crit critical, I think, is the extent to which we feel able to contribute to the decision making about how change might be implemented and managed and whether the future looks better following any kind of change. Change, especially when it involves entering an uncertain future, generates anxiety. And this requires the exercise of personal capacities. Sometimes that's all that we have. But change can also be facilitated by ensuring that the right process is in place to contain anxiety and, and enable us to act even whilst on the boundary of not knowing. Water reform in the Murray-Darling Basin is, of course, an old problem, a wicked issue in that it's been argued over since the time of Federation. Yet at this juncture, it also is an example of a contemporary dilemma. 
as we attend to grapple with the impact of future climate change as well as current water usage and consider, begin to consider the transformation of reimagined basin communities to, in order to ensure their future sustainability with less water. It's therefore a good example of the challenges that lie ahead as Australia tries to develop adult conversations about complex dilemmas. Yet what struck me most, really, whilst participating in the debate, as well as observing public meetings, academic discussions, media reporting, blogs, and talking with a diverse range of people living and working in the basin, as well as politicians and public servants, has been the partiality of views expressed, the lack of generosity to the standpoint of others, and the extent to which many of the debates fix people in positions from which it is very difficult to extricate themselves. A process perhaps reinforced especially in the world of blogging, by which you have contributors who share similar perspectives who join the debate only to review, re reinforce the views of previous writers and in a sense kind of add further grist to the mill. Conversely, there's uh, little attempt to appreciate or acknowledge the arguments, emotions, and experiences of those who take a different viewpoint. For example, I've heard variously some environmentalists and city dwellers dismiss the concerns of farmers who fear for the future as always having something to complain about. Having done well previously, being overprotected by government, subsidized through taxation generated in urban areas, of rotting the system, despoilers of the environment, and backed by wealthy and aggressive farm lobbies, the powerful vocal agri-political minority lobby group, as one blogger described them, exercising undue influence on local councils, mayors, state and federal MPs. Alternatively, farmers are placed on a can-do-no-harm pedestal, symbols of an Australian heritage whose sacrifices have ensured Australian food security. Again, the impact of water reform on basin communities has been dismissed as just yet another chapter in the Australian story of, house, of towns long abandoned, part of the landscape, in projects that have failed and people have moved on, yet another example, another episode of the boom and bust cycle. Equally, environmentalists are frequently portrayed by those in irrigation as belonging to a privileged, smug, minority, urban, extremist special interest group who know little about regional life or farming, but are very happy to buy the food produced by those they criticize, who disregard the role of food production in building the cities. Without immigration, 90%, sorry, without irrigation, 90% of Australia, including its capital cities, would be uninhabitable, according to one farmer blogger. And who wish to return, so we're told, return the environment to some pre-colonial pristine state and who pursue lifestyles more harmful to the environment but disregard the heritage claims of farmers and their contribution to land care, the identities of basin communities and a sense of loss in the face of change. And even now, having seen the resignation of the first, uh, first of all of the chair of the Murray-Darling Basin Authority and then more, more recently the uh, CEO, and as we approach the time when a draft basin plan is due to be released, along with a report of the parliamentary inquiry into the socioeconomic impacts of the basin plan chaired by Tony Windsor, there's a sense that one gets out of Canberra really that it's yet another short-term stitch-up solution designed to deflate the issue as a political hot potato rather than address the substantial issues. A solution that could involve the invention of new in the commas, scientific data and a disregard ultimately for the Water Act. So what contributes to this kind of dilemma? Well, clearly there are many, many factors, some general and some specific to Australia, and I just want to really highlight uh, just a few of those. I guess, first of all, having spent years devising and protecting ever more narrow areas of specialization, we're now confronted with the partiality of our own expertise and the urgent need to build transdisciplinary approaches if we are to fully understand the problems and develop comprehensive, holistic solutions. Thus, a recent publication, To Live Within Earth's Limits, from the Australian Academy of Sciences, argued in putting a case for a new transdisciplinary 
earth science system, that the social sciences must be recognized as absolutely essential, as human responses to changes are unpredictable and human interactions with the biophysical insufficiently understood. The authors went on to conclude that we need now to realize that some far-sighted environmental stewardship is needed for our long-term well-being and that this may need to override our personal self-interest and market forces in deciding how resources are used. Yet the challenge to knowledge goes further, for such responses are still, in a sense, expert-driven, when what is also required is to put this knowledge alongside experiential, innate, or practice-driven knowledge, often the product of slow maturation over generations and passed on largely through an oral tradition. The failure to recognize such local knowledge, expertise, and know-how has been a major impediment in the determination of the Murray-Darling Basin Plan. Yet if the first steps are to break free from disciplinary mentalities and accord recognition to non-formal knowledge, then the next step is to accept that the combination of all our existing knowledges will still leave us having to work with considerable uncertainty on the boundaries of knowing and not knowing. The political theorist John Keane, writing recently in the Griffith Review about democracy, captured it this well when he described this democracy as an exercise in living on the edge of future time. And nearly 10 years ago, American academics Gunderson and Holling called for both an integrative response and the adoption of a view of nature as evolving, requiring a process of active learning and new institutions in order to flexibly adapt. Yet our, as our awareness grows of the complex interconnected nature of such problems and the limitations of our own existing knowledge, so our anxiety levels increase. Complexity and uncertainty with its attendant anxieties cannot, cannot however, be an impediment to action, for we must learn to act whilst not knowing, making good enough decisions, learning from those decisions, and being aware of our assumptions and our emotional states as we proceed. This is what the American Donald Schoen, an organizational expert, referred to as double loop learning, or the ability to reflect upon and question the assumptions, paradigms, and mindsets that we operate with. And he later developed that into the idea of triple loop learning as reflecting on how we learn, our attitudes, values, assumptions, and feelings. And William Isaacs, founder of the Dialogue Project at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, has promoted the practice of dialogue between often antagonistic groups as a container that permits the collective suspension of assumptions and actively encourages us to better understand the perspectives of others rather than immediately defending our own position. Similar views about the need for such a container for anxiety are also expressed within psychotherapeutic literature, not just for individuals who are under stress, but also for groups, organizations, and communities, as well as for the healthy development of children. In my work on water reform, I've been aware though of just how far away we are from such learning and receptivity. Rather, I've been much more conscious of how often the exchanges between pr protagonists descend into abuse or often conveyed in a disrespectful, aggressive, threatening, somewhat macho manner, and underpinned by an assumption that the categories of farmer and environmentalist are each homogenous. Reflecting on an earlier reform period, Paul Kelly again notes that reform must be intellectually sound. Yet my, from my experience, there's also been a marked disrespect shown to experts or intellectuals. Although this does not seem to apply so much to those with technical expertise or creative ingenuity. Now here I refer neither to the healthy skepticism and robust response towards any claimed expertise as advocated by Donald Horn, which is an essential cornerstone of any successful democracy. Nor do I mean the conspiracy theories of people such as the, the Citizens Electoral Council of Australia, who claim that the Wentworth Group of Concerned Scientists is a front organization for the World Wildlife Front under the leadership of Prince Charles, promoting a fraudulent science as part of a genocidal plot hatched by the British Crown 
and aimed at eliminating Australia's national food supply in order to reassert complete British imperial control over a devastated nation of five to six million human beings. Uh, as they stated in their uh, December 2010 edition of the New Citizen. But rather, I refer to what I think is the apparent ambiguity that surrounds the place and role of the intellectual in Australian life. That seems to manifest itself in a number of ways. It's as though the tension between the cultural norms of egalitarianism and intellectualism or expertise can only be managed, in a sense, by denigrating the latter, as in the, in the tall poppy syndrome. Perhaps people are, of ideas are marginal in a land of doers. We see it too in the retreat of academics from the role of a public intellectual, with some notable exceptions. A point elaborated upon earlier this month in the Australian Literary Review by, the, by Peter Shergold, former secretary of the Department of the Prime Minister and Cabinet, and currently heading up a cross-university uh, centre for social impact. And he's also the Chancellor of the University of Western Sydney. Shergold speaks of the chasm between research and influence and between the policy intellectual and the policy practitioner. Despite the Commonwealth Government's support for problem solving, sent the focus of cooperative research centres, too few academics seem to engage in public debate or make themselves or their ideas accessible to a broader public. Too few have learned how to work with the media. Incidentally, the absence of public intellectuals is also something recently debated in the UK, in a debate in which Susie Orbach spoke of the craving for that thoughtfulness which public intellectuals are able to, to provide. While Lisa Jardine felt that there was little respect for such intellectuals, and Will Self spoke of the resistance to theory and theoreticians playing too prominent a role in public life, a view echoed by the physicist Brian Cox who expressed his wariness of iconic people behaving almost like they are cult figures. So there are dangers of elevating people to celebrity status, of people speaking on topics of which they know little, and of being suckered into political agendas, and as a consequence, losing the capacity to speak with a critical voice. Current university research uh, funding, though, with its emphasis on publishing in international prestigious peer-reviewed academic journals that are rarely read beyond a small readership of discipline-focused colleagues is an, ad an additional disincentive to engage in public discourse. And in its teaching abilities, tertiary education is now faced with a growing number of students from more diverse backgrounds, and perhaps it's been pre pre too preoccupied with equipping students with labor market competencies rather than encouraging a pursuit of education as an end in itself. <laughs> in some cases, this retreat from public discourse is understandable as well, as some employers, whether university or government, have often been overanxious about the en ensuing controversy or simply hostile to the idea and have threatened career futures if academics or scientists continue to speak out in public. But perhaps this antipathy towards academic expertise is also a product of previous experiences in which the public has been less than impressed by what academics have had to offer or the extent to which people have felt exploited in their previous encounters. Trust must be earned, of course, and perhaps academia has failed, uh, has fallen short in this respect. But this retreat of the intellectual has been made worse by what has happened inside government, especially at federal government level where I think we've seen a hollowing out of intellectual capacity to the point where, there's no longer, where they no longer appear to have the capability to provide the analytical skills and policy capacities needed for policy reform. The outcome of the uh, Moran Review of Australian Public Service in 2010, with its calls for the, for the qualities of agility, vocation, and vision, may, however, lead to some capacity-building initiatives to reverse that trend. One hopes that it will. But meanwhile, public intellectuals and academics have been replaced by the private consultant, not as intellectuals, but as people providing government with quick answers to complex problems and required to gather data but not reflect, not offer a critique or develop new insights 
or thoughtful policy responses. And from my experience in working with the Murray-Darling Basin Authority, of having to function with very close oversight over what can be said and the style and manner in which it can be written. Associated with this ambigu ambiguity towards the expert is also, I think, an apparent reluctance to learn from experiences elsewhere, and an insistence almost that what confronts Australia is somehow unique to itself. Equally strong seems to be a belief that Australia has developed its own ways of doing things, the spirit of Australia, so that proposals that reflect a European sensitivity gain little credibility. And it is assumed that some things, such as structural adjustment strategies, simply don't work here, or that the expertise, the values, and the attitudes don't exist, and governments don't have the capacity. And I've also been struck as well by the lack of trust in government at all levels, and, conversing, and, and conversely, a disturbing belief amongst Basin communities that they too have very little political influence. There's a very strong sense in the Basin in which, in which politicians and public servants, especially those bureaucrats in Canberra, were seen as out of touch, far removed, rarely visible in the basin, and that when they did visit, they could, they were, could neither answer questions and nor did they reflect back what they'd heard from people in the basin in any of the subsequent published reports, to the point where basin residents could see little value in such consultations. And one might add that despite the rhetoric to the contrary, government agencies and departments continue to operate largely in siloed spaces, with insufficient cross-referencing and dialogue both within departments and between them, and certainly between different levels of government. Not only is this a recipe for inadequate policy, but communities are frustrated by the inconsistencies, by the pu poor communication, and by the interdepartmental rivalries. And where there are examples of collaboration, they only seem to occur at a single level within a hierarchy or in relation to a specific project between particular professional interests. It's far then from being a core cultural norm that pervades an entire organization, let alone a government. Both the, R the Gillard and the Rudd governments were criticized and have been criticized for poor implementation of policy. And no doubt as a result, public servants adopt risk averse practices in major long-term strategic policy areas, though, such as water reform, there's a concern also that no single department or agency has the capacity to work with such complexity. Again, in my research, when asked to identify an agency or department at any level of government that could take on a leadership role in, in relation to water reform, respondents in the basin, without exception, were unable to identify any department or agency at all. So there's something of a vicious circle here. For as governments are perceived to be failing in policy implementation, so public confidence and trust in government declines even further. As Lindquist and Warner note, community disappointments are treated as policy failures, and as Paul Kelly said, botched reforms have counterproductive consequences. Similarly, Basin communities felt that the expertise, knowledge, and creativity within the Basin itself had largely been ignored, and they took this as a sure sign that the political class a little respect for those living and working there. In fact, in most Basin communities, it wasn't at all difficult to identify a number of people from different parts of the community who took on and held leadership roles and who had respect from others within the community. Yet there was a strong sense in which the authority failed to identify or gain support from that local leadership, on whom, of course, much would depend uh, in any change kind of process. While discussions on the future of Basin communities need to extend far beyond any current leadership group to embrace the whole community, nevertheless, securing their, their endorsement is critical and not just a way of gaining access to others, but also because this is an impressive, creative, and knowledgeable group of people well aware of the long-standing issues in their local community and the need for water reform, and for whom much from whom much can be learned about what needs, what needs doing. No doubt, too, one can trace some of the origins of these concerns back through Australia's history to the harsh realities of settlement, to the fact that Federation was born out of a process of negotiation by previously independent uh, colonies, 
and that the challenges of building a national identity. In particular, a country of migrants, many escaping from far worse circumstances, increasingly culturally uh, diverse, seeking to find a place and wishing to conform, can lead to weaker collective bonds and vision and a more instrumental and self-interested approach to policy reform. But on the positive side of this experience has been my engagement with the Wentworth Group of Concerned Scientists. And I just want to, uh, in terms of today, uh, mention four things very, very quickly. The first is that apart from a small, very small group of employees, those who contribute as members of the Wentworth, Wentworth, Wentworth Group receive no payment at all and little in the way of acknowledgement as individual contributions are often remain anonymous. But second, there's the rigor of the science itself. Not only has the published science been brought together by an interdisciplinary group of scientists pooling knowledge and insight and in an environment largely free from the competitiveness of the workplace, but each paper and proposition has been subjected to rigorous peer review leading to endless revisions and reworkings before final drafted and been signed off by the membership. Third has been Wentworth's capacity to embrace other disciplines as it, has, as it has begun to understand the limits and the partiality of its own extensive knowledge. First of all, by engaging economists to model ways in which to maximize efficiencies in terms of water diversions. The next and possibly even more challenging aspect was to engage social scientists to explore models of how to work with those communities in the basin, those most affected by reform, and to work in a way with those so that those communities would have a maximum opportunity for a sustainable future with less water. There is more to be done in this regard, but nevertheless, Wentworth provides an example of an organization that is in learning mode, extending its boundaries and drawing in relevant expertise to build its knowledge base and then sharing and revising that knowledge in the light of feedback while questioning its own often implicit assumptions. Wentworth is a self-styled expert policy community whose purpose is to influence policy, the policy making process by bringing the best science to the attention of key stakeholders and in a way that makes sense to the layperson. Ultimately though, it is a belief in the power of the best available knowledge made available to those who most need it and who are able to use it to shape policy, although they're not naive enough to think that that's the only way in which, uh, that only knowledge, in a sense, makes policy. However, having published its, re its report, Sustainable Diversions, in the Murray-Darling Basin in June 2010, the Wentworth Group quickly realized that the need, there was a need to take their kind of arguments to those other than the usual suspects in politics, government departments and its agencies, and those claiming to represent particular sections of the community and to the media. It realized that the key discussions had to be had in the basin itself with farmers and growers, locally elected representatives, and those who otherwise live and work there. And since June, it has conducted and continues to do so meetings across the basin with anyone willing to meet them visiting farms, talking with local irrigation organizations, and taking phone calls and emails from individual farmers and community members. When the June document was first published, there was much opposition from the farming and irrigation communities to Wentworth's figure on the required volume of water needed for the environment, 4,400 gigaliters. The purpose of those meetings then was to show how those figures had been derived, where the water should come from, and what could be done to ensure a sustainable future for basin communities. But they also went to hear and respond to those whom they met. Often the meetings were difficult, they were always frank, and they didn't necessarily lead to agreement. But what was, common, what was a common outcome was the sometimes grudging respect that Wentworth uh, received really for having taken the time and been willing to engage face to face with those most opposed to their proposals. Meanwhile, Wentworth itself went away with a deeper understanding of the issues and a greater appreciation of how to work better with people in the basin. It learned, for example, that not all farmers and growers share the views expressed and the positions adopted by, by their representative bodies, 
but are inhibited often from expressing counter views anxious about the consequences. Yet without those voices speaking out, debate is diminished and different perspectives cannot be explored. The hope is that such encounters and others like them will mark the beginnings of a new conversation to ensure the best outcome for our environment and for our own communities. However, I fear that this may have come too late. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Chris, for that um, insightful sort of reflections of where we're at as a community and, and governments and tackling issues and uncertainties, uh, particularly the Murray-Darling. Having been involved in, um, in par parliamentary inquiries, um, I was somewhat disillusioned at, at, the fe at federal inquiries. It's been, it's, it seemed to me that political parties stack access of who actually speaks and then what actually happens out of an inquiry. And we really, really don't um, pull together all of that knowledge that is needed to actually um, address the questions that are often really important and critical questions that are raised in those in inquiries in a process and that we really aren't building our capacity and, utilize and utilising the capacity that we actually do have in terms of un addressing uncertainties and challenges. Um, and we must get better at it, we must get better at it and we must try and engage and improve. And the Wentworth Group, I guess, is, has tried to do that in terms of working across discipline, across the universities, but you've obviously found out that you need to engage across those areas that you're talking about with the mm. active learning participants mm. and, and the farmers. I'd like to open it up to the floor for questions. Have a, if you can just wait till we get a mic to you because we're recording the session. I thought um, everything you said there was very relevant. Um, and I've been disillusioned personally with politics for uh, over, I don't know, five or six years now. Um, and it, the last three, three and a half years, I've spent um, creating my own education to try and create solutions for those exact problems. And I've designed a framework that goes further than what a lot of your explanations went uh, towards. Um, I've developed, it's called Community Leverage, or Leverage, and it's a framework for a globally accessible, 100% free education ne network and training network um, that utilizes basically all of the best elements of the internet, YouTube, uh, social media, and uh, essentially collects um, all of the information into categories which are filtered and allows p will allow people to um, create their own self-directed education from uh, basically whenever they're capable of using a computer through till death, and um, which death is not even really inevitable anymore. With the uh, I'm looking forward to the. Uh, the, the forum on human longevity later in the Ideas Festival. Uh, I wouldn't mind living forever, but we've got to create a, a sustainable planet if that's ever going to be possible. And I think through a collaborative um, movement to put this a globally accessible education network onto the global stage uh, and have a debate over that, uh, I think we can honestly, in five to ten years, set up a framework that will achieve uh, a mass retraining of the, of the workforce. We are, we are, like in Australia, uh, we don't have the population to um, change the employment um, to focus on sustainability at the moment. Uh, the government's talking about importing all these skilled labour people and all that sort of stuff. But really, if you look at it from a, a global perspective and where everything's sort of falling down at the moment, my view of it is that intellectual property and the current monetary system in its form current format is what's preventing us from moving forward and no one's willing to table the conversation on the on the global stage that we really need to readjust the monetary system and if we want the employment to go to move into uh, sustainability why aren't we looking at using technology to downsize finance banking which they already want to get rid of their their staff because of technology why aren't we, 
we're using these people that are um, capable of complex thinking to start working on the solutions of sustainability for the future. And through, through this system, I've also designed feedback mechanisms, so every bit of information that goes out has a couple of questions tapped on. So we uh, enable educated people to put their opinion forward to be collated, uh, filtered through data, uh, through, through certain, certain systems. Um, and then we have all that information that's accessible in real time on all the major issues. And it'd only take a couple of years because all the technology's here. We're starting developed worlds. Uh, if we got rid of intellectual property, we could start to mass produce all of the highest technology needs that we have. Uh, we could spread that through digital technology and training that we could do. We could simul simultaneously um, have people setting up 10 solar power plants at the one time and have people in control rooms and cameras on people or video cameras. You could use any sort of technology to really um, use Moore's law and it exponentially increase the speed at which we head towards sustainability. Question is respond. Right, well, I'm sure there's a question in there. Um, oh, yeah, I forgot <laughs> to, I, I didn't put it in a question, but um, do you think it's possible to <laughs> change the political <laughs> landscape before the next election? <laughs> I think what I was, and I think that, I mean, that what you say sounds, uh, Sounds great. Um, I think what I was trying to suggest really is something slightly different really, which is that whatever the solution, yours might be an excellent solution, but the whatever the solution, uh, solutions could be, that in a sense, uh, what's been troubling really is our, for me, has been the extent, has been our capacity to explore solutions and explore them in ways that actually, uh, um, you know, that where we're talking about very difficult kind of issues that impact directly upon people in very immediate ways, water reform in the basin being one example, that you know, we're talking potentially about the social and economic life of some basin communities being transformed, uh, some perhaps communities disappearing. So they're real, very real fundamental issues for the people in those circumstances, and, but they should also be our common concern as well in terms of... Uh, uh, because if we're not talking about people in the basin communities, we might be talking about what happens when uh, you know, the, uh, people in the banking sector uh, lose their jobs or whatever. So it's about how we actually uh, attend to those common problems rather than, in a sense, just simply saying, well, we leave it to everybody else. To s we leave it to everybody to sort out their own uh, lives, really, and uh, some will make it and some will not do so well, and that's just the way it is because that's the way life is. How, how do would you see a network like I've described where everyone could be educated in whatever they wanted, whatever interested them or affected them? Sure. How, how do you think that that would affect the political landscape? Mm. Well, I think uh, people's access to, e to education is, uh, is a fundamental right and uh, the, uh, uh, the more the people can access uh, freely, the better, uh, by, you know, obviously. Uh, but I think the real issue is then what we do with that education and that learning and how we actually share that and engage with people because that seems to me to be, um, you know, we'll only go forward in, in the future if we can really find some collective solutions um, and find ways before, before the solution of find ways of, uh, of working across what our boundaries and divisions currently. I think we've got another question over here. Mm. Can I just say one more, one quickly, one more thing? Hang on, hang on. you've had two questions. I'm going to pass the mic on to somebody else to have a question. Just over here. <laughs> I think you, you ba have two basic uh, matters which should be dealt with, and those are specifically we have a lack of what I would call leadership with real wisdom in it, and... If we have that in the Murray-Darling Basin, we will probably do great things. And the other thing that is maybe forgotten by all of us is that we should communicate face-to-face -face with people, really communicate, not just have box-ticking exercises and consultative groups, etc. Would you like to comment? Um. Well, certainly in relation to your second point, I mean, I uh, absolutely agree. I think, again, we've, um, we have a diminished capacity to, uh, as I was saying before, in a sense to talk with each other. And, uh, and that's difficult because often what we're talking about is, is, is very close to us. We have strong, very strong feelings about these things. 
It arouses lots of strong emotions, the, the things that we're talking about. So it's quite, you know, and we become, when we are uh, listening to other views that, that seem to threaten our interests, we tend to be somewhat defensive and to, um, uh, in a sense, to kind of roar back fighting, as it were. So it's quite hard to find the space to actually, I talked about it as being a container that we can, um, you know, in a sense, we can put aside some of our own assumptions, beliefs, interests, and just try to make a better connection with, begin to make a better connection with the perspectives of the other. It doesn't necessarily mean we're ultimately going to agree with them, but at least we have to begin listening in ways, in, in much more profound kind of ways. But that's exactly what we're able to do, isn't it? To be able to do that. Indeed, indeed. But I think, you know, your point about leadership in the basin, I think one of the ironies is that there is leadership in the basin. Uh, there are, uh, there are certainly examples, uh, met many uh, really, uh, excellent uh, leaders who live and work in the basin um, and who do hold the respect of, of uh, people in those communities. They do understand the need for reform, water reform. Um, they have a really good understanding about their local situation and what needs to be done, what could be done to improve these kinds of things. Um, but they also feel as though you know that knowledge has been uh, neglected or ignored or uh, discounted. And so there's a lack of leadership in the outside debate. You're talking about the interviewers, yes. the yes. universities or, or whatever. Yes. Well, yes, and I think what I was trying to describe really is in a sense how the, um, that, the, that leadership kind of capacity, that knowledge capacity within government has been hollowed out. I used, used that kind of phrase. Um, so now government looks external to, externally to consultants to provide the information and the insight. But consultants are working, you know, they, they, uh, they're paid by the day. And uh, when they finish one piece of work, they go on to the next piece of work. They don't necessarily have any particular commitment to what they are working on. Uh, they're just working on a project. And they're not being paid as for their intellectualism and their, and their thoughtfulness, in a sense. They're paid for answers to... Um, showed a lack of leadership in those employing the consultants who should be saying they should be leading a community with great wisdom mm. and they didn't say any mm. such wisdom. I think yep. we've got another question mm. here. At the moment there seems to be a great emphasis on the basin but is that Australia's premier area of concern or and are the models developed eventually transferable to other areas, such as northern Queensland with cyclones and so on, which they don't have down there? Mm. So I wonder, is it just, you know, mm. the thing of the, of, of the moment where everyone can get working at and mm. where everyone can get sort of uh, do the bit, mm. but can that be transferred to other areas? Mm. That's my main concern. Mm. Well, ideally, it should be transferable because, in a sense, what we should have been able to develop in the Murray-Darling Basin is a is a is a model of how you bring about significant social and economic reform that impacts. You know, there are two million people who live in the basin, so it's and it's a, as we know, it's a huge area covering what fourteen percent of Australian land. So it's, it's, a, it's a large area, lots of people looking at a significant reform process. We should have been able to develop a process by which you introduce reform and you engage people within that process. I don't think we've been able to do that. Uh, I think in, in some ways um, I would be hopeful that we would not seek to transfer <laughs> the model that has been used in the basin anywhere else because I think it's been a disaster uh, in terms of how you actually engage people in these kinds of difficult discussions. Um, we, sh I mean, we should have learned a lot from, not how, to from how not to do things. Uh, and in that, and if, we can, if we can do that, we might be able to build a model um, of how to do it better. Um, but I'm, one of the things I mentioned right at the beginning is that I've been advising uh, the Murray-Darling Basin Authority on uh, introducing localism be as, as, as a consequence of uh, in other words, um, the devolution of some decision making and, and responsibility down to the very local level in terms of implementation of a, of a plan. 
Um, and that really came about because um, the minister in the uh, Department of Regional Australia um, um, came up with the, you know, sort of got hold of this notion of localism. And so then people were effectively flapping about saying, well, what does it mean and how do you do it? Now, I think it's, it's, um, it's, it's kind of dangerous, really. It's, it makes me kind of anxious when uh, um, everyone thinks we must introduce localism, but people in, in, the, in government departments really don't know what it means, how to do it, um, and, and clearly don't know either how to find out for themselves. So they're kind of, again, saying, well, we must find somebody outside who can give us these answers. I think that's, you know, that's a kind of, um, that doesn't look good in terms of developing models that we might be able to use and or to address other kinds of, perhaps even more challenging, I mean, problems. I mean, if we aren't been unable to deal with the Murray-Darling Basin so far, what, what are the prospects for climate change? I think we'll just take one last question over here. <coughs> Thanks for your comments on the Murray Darling. I'm resident of it and uh, have been involved at the local and regional level in the discussions. Um, what gets me is that when people talk sustainability, it comes down to a question, I know what I'm doing is sustainable, therefore why should I change? And perhaps we should more develop a an attitude which encourages change and thinking along other lines. And same with the debate in the basin, it's more been protection of, of our existing water rights mm. rather than looking forward to what we can change to do. Um, mm. yeah, there's nothing new in change. No, there was no. a fishing industry in the Murray, yep. 500 tonnes a year mm. up to about 1950. Mm. Now it's illegal to commercially sell a native fish in the Queensland section of the base, so I don't know about others. Mm. Mm. Well, again, I think you're absolutely right. And I've been, but ironically, again, um, as a consequence of the drought, as I'm sure you will know, um, farmers and irrigators across the basin were constantly making adaptations and changes um, each year, each season, as the drought continued. But in a sense, uh, what they, I guess, were always hoping was that the drought would end and things would get back to the way they were before. So the kind of adaptations that they were making were, in a sense, certainly reactive adaptations, piecemeal adaptations, uh, some of them very creative, but it's a different kind of change process than when you're having to plan ahead uh, and you're looking at, a, at, a, at a quite an uncertain sort of future. So you're, you know, you're, starting, you're starting to work with that, with that kind of uncertainty. It's a different that kind of proactive planning, I think, is it requires different kinds of capacities and different levels of sort of risk taking. But I think, in a sense, the, all of us do have, um, ec we exercise all our time, our adapt adaptive capacities. Um, it's really about how we harness those capacities to deal with these kind of challenging, complex problems, rather than adopting how do we protect what we've got position. I think we're going to wrap up the session because um, we're right, keep to our time schedule mm. in an afternoon. Mm. I'd like us to um, join together and thank Chris for his <laughs> presentation. Thank you. Thanks so much. Mm.